is the, that most people are more inclined to be fearful of snakes than they are fearful of, say, other animals, of, of kittens or something like that. Um, and in fact, one of the, the examples uh, that I like to use is a study that had been done uh, a few years back at the University of Chicago, which I think demonstrates this. Uh, they, took, they took baby monkeys that had been raised in, in captivity who had never seen a snake before, had not been taught to fear snakes, and then they, sh they showed them uh, on the screen, they had this field, and they would splice in certain images that then would emerge from the field, and then they would monitor the monkeys' responses to it. And so they put, you know, they had like a flower coming up, and they had a bunny coming up, and, and, uh, and, and the monkeys' physiological response typically was, was unremarkable. And then they had a snake coming up, and the snakes, uh, and the, the monkeys all responded with fear and anxiety to that snake, even though they had never seen snakes before, and even though they had not been taught to fear snakes. And this seems confirmation of that hereditary bias, that inclination to film snakes. Now the way that this intersects with culture is that when we have these, and it's not always conscious, in fact often it's not conscious, but when we have such a fear, we tend then to make it part of our culture. And by culture, what he's talking about is our artwork, our stories, our language, you know, our, our, our eating habits, those kinds of things that we do in connection with each other. Um, we tend to make it part of our culture. And so in our stories, and our narratives, and our artwork, snakes have, have assumed the, this position of, of a kind of of uh, uh, objects of, of, of fear or, or uh, awe. And uh, one of the questions that, that I like to ask my students when we're talking about this to get at the, the distinction between worldviews is um, if, you, if, you take the, if you take the creation story in the, in the Old Testament and you have, uh, you have the serpent who is seducing Eve, offering Eve the opportunity to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which has been proscribed, been prohibited by God. Uh, if that's part of the story, the question becomes, why, why is there a snake in this story? If you're a biblical literalist, that is somebody who reads the Bible as historical fact, as, as literally true, the answer to that question would be, there's a snake in, in this part of the creation story because that's the way it happened. There was actually a, a serpent, and the serpent uh, seduced Eve into eating of, of this fruit. If you're an empiricist who understands this genetic uh, cultural pre-evolution, you would say the reason that there's a snake in this story is because this is a cultural artifact, certainly the, the, the narrative itself, and that the composer of this narrative, and it's not, it's not peculiar to, to uh, Judeo-Christianity, the, the composer of this narrative made use of the snake because of that epigenetic inclination to fear snakes. And then once it's in the narrative, it becomes reinforced. That fear becomes re reinforced. So this is an example of what he's talking about, the way that the genes and culture begin to, to, to work upon each other or bound up with each other. What he does also in this chapter, and it's a long chapter, and it's, a, it's an interesting one, but he, he begins to define culture for us. And those signifiers, what he calls nodes, the signifiers of culture, those things that represent something that we all share, that we all understand, and the way that the brain begins to develop in lines of these culture. He, he says at one point, we tend to make sense of the world in the way that we've always made sense of it. That is, those sort of neural pathways that have been, in, have been forged through this combination. And when we come upon new material, we want to make sense of it in the way that we've always made sense of it. But as human beings, there are particular ways that we make sense of things, and there are particular ways that we construct culture. Largely through language, we, unlike any other species, are language-making uh, beings. We make language, and it becomes, the, it becomes really the vehicle of our culture. We tend to, he suggests later, we tend to be dyadic. That is, we tend to see the world in terms of twos, in terms of uh, binary oppositions. 
We divide the world up in that way. We tend to be inclined to see faces. Uh, and and uh, you'll note, for instance, that infants uh, can only actually see with clarity for the first part of their life about 18 inches, which is about the distance between the crook of the mother's arm and, and her face. We tend to focus upon faces primarily. We tend to move toward reification, which is quite literally the making of abstract concepts into, into concrete, uh, concrete images. And, all, and these things all sort of move together to illustrate, uh, again, some of the reasons that we do things in our culture and how they have this neurophysiological basis. Again, the example that I'm going to use, and I'm going to kind of hurry this up because I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, the example that I'm going to use is, is from 9-11. Uh, you might have seen some of the photos of the smoke billowing out of one of the towers. And, uh, and in one of the photos, it looked as if Satan's face, there was a demonic face. And, and, and the smoke. And on the one hand, you might say, well, it's there because uh, that was actually Satan's face represented in the smoke. Or you might look at all these qualities and suggest the reason we see or inclined to see Satan's face in the smoke is because we tend to focus upon faces, we tend to be dyadic, that is, it becomes a signifier of evil up against good, so it helps us to understand and, and, and order the world because it's an act of reification, making some abstract quality evil concrete. Okay, now I think I have like two minutes or so, right? Do I have to finish at five after? We have class at 15 after? Okay, I'll get through this. Uh, in the last chapter, that of, that of ethics and religion, he divides a worldview into transcendentalist and empiricist uh, perspectives. The, the transcendentalist generally will say our moral codes come to us from outside of us, they come from a law-giving God. The empiricist will say that our moral codes come to us from, from, uh, from material sources, from our need to survive. And here generally is, is how his argument works. That in any group, when people began to live together, there needed to be certain moral codes in order to provide for their uh, survival. And so there, we lean toward, we have this inclination for cooperation. We cooperate with each other. We don't engage, and he uses his example of adultery, we don't engage in adultery and that sort of thing because it tears at the fabric of the community. These codes were in place in, in tribes and communities long before, and they necessarily were, long before the establishment of religion. When religion began and the law-giving gods were created, what it did was to sacralize, make sacred, those codes that were already in the past. And so to give them much more weight, much more resonance. Um, so at this point, what we see is that the codes come to us out of that necessity for survival, precede, they come before the development of religion. Religion simply hardens them, makes them part of the culture and the narratives and the stories, and makes it more difficult to, to avoid them, particularly if you have an omniscient God who's paying attention to, to what you're doing. We don't really, we resist this, again, he says, because we evolved to believe in religion, in that impulse. It's much more emotionally satisfying for us. Science is not emotionally satisfying for us. But we still need those sacred narratives. And this is where he calls on the poets, that they can construct the story of evolutionary history in the language that appeals to that emotional desire. The reason he wants to do this is because he believes we can then begin to, to construct longer lasting moral codes if we really know the source of them, rather than being uh, misdirected. Okay, now, very briefly, uh, Mills, or excuse me, Wilson's epistemology, what is it that we can know? How do we know? Well, he's an empiricist. Uh, he believes in, in uh, the investigation of experience and physical reality. He's a progressivist that we can improve. As, as, as we do so. Uh, in terms of ontology, what's real for him? Well, the physical is real for him. The, the transcendental, the metaphysical, is not real for him other than as a symptom of, of uh, neurophysiological processes. And our ethics, well, we're inclined to cooperate. We're inclined to, to uh, value the community itself, which leads us to a kind of xenophobia, inclination to xenophobia, distrust of strangers. If we know these kinds of things, we can affect better, longer-lasting ethical codes. Okay, that's it.